I'm going, what I'm going to try and do is sort of have this sort of fine balance uh, between people who know something about archaeology and people who don't know anything about archaeology. So those of you who do know a lot, bear with me as I go through this, okay? Right, off we go. You know, this is quite a pleasant experience. We wander around, we crawl in, we look in the, you know, this is great fun. But imagine going into one of these things back in the Neolithic, where you've got half decomposing bodies, and the smell of the flesh is hanging off the bones. This isn't actually rather nice at all. Um, so you can understand why people, like myself, have argued that these are containers where that sort of process occurs, out of sight, so people don't actually get exposed to these things. Just in passing, um, in terms of this notion of the tombs being open for a long period of time, there was a dating program undertaken probably about 10 years ago now by Alistair Whittle and his team um, further south. And lo and behold, these monuments which we thought stayed open for a long period of time had very short duration. In fact, it looked like the bones or the bodies were going in and all this process was occurring over, over just like 80 or 90 years. So much shorter duration than we thought, which suddenly starts to complicate this idea of communal tombs, communal burial. <coughs> and because of the, this, sometimes the arrangement of bones, the fact that when you look at the bones, they're incomplete. You don't get complete bodies. Uh, so it looks like bones are being removed as well as being rearranged. And as a consequence of that, uh, people uh, like Julian Thomas, Chris Fowler, and, and myself, and a whole series of other uh, Neolithic archaeologists basically have seen these bones then becoming commodities, things that you can exchange, this notion of the dispersed person across communities and across different groups. So what I'm really trying to emphasize here is this notion of how they've been thought as tombs, and also that it's the bones which is the important thing. That is, it's the rites of passage occur, and it's only when you get to the bones that the, that process is complete, and uh, things can be moved around and exchanged. So here's the question then, or the questions. Our chamber is really the final resting place for the dead. Our, are they really a tomb like we think of a tomb? And I, I would extend that and say, are these monuments like we think of as monuments? And are the skeletal remains central to the mortuary process? That is, is the whole object a sort of transformation from life to death, being concurrent with the removal of the flesh from the bones? So those are the questions. And of course, I'm going to say no, aren't I? <laughs> but we'll wait, don't want to jump the gun on this. <laughs> So how should we think about this? I don't know how many of, I don't know how many of you have come across this book, uh, Crocker. I'm sure you have. Uh, uh, Flann O'Brien is a, a contemporary of James Joyce, and um, the third policeman's a really interesting, strange, surreal book in many ways. Uh, now, why have I introduced this? Well. Um, this, I won't give away the story in itself, but the protagonist is escorted around a strange world by a policeman, okay? And the book's interspersed by these strange philosophical musings of, I can't remember his name now, D something, the, the, the philosopher, who isn't a real philosopher, it's a fictional philosopher, okay? And finally, they get to a village, and uh, the postman's bicycle has been hidden. Okay, and they're looking for this bicycle, and uh, I just put this, and I'm just going to to read this out, and this is the so he said, do you ever discover discover or hear tell of the atomic theory? This is a theory by this this philosopher. No, I answered. He leaned his mouth confidentially over my ear. Would it surprise you to be told? He said darkly that the atomic theory is at work in this parish. It would indeed. The atomic theory, I sallied, is a thing that is not clear to me at all. Um, Michael Gillihan, and no, he's the postman, said so, is an example of man that is nearly bejanked by the principle of the atomic theory. 
Would it astonish you to hear that he is nearly half a bicycle? <laughs> it would surprise me unconditionally, I said. <laughs> so what's going on here? Well, what's going on here? This is a world which is, um, kind of, or this, this world where the atomic theory is being applied, is totally different from our world, in as much as the reason that the postman is becoming bicycle and the bicycle is becoming postman is because the postman spends so much time sitting on his bicycle, that is, physically attached, some of the bicycle flows into him and some of, the bi uh, some of him flows into the bicycle. And there's a really interesting bit in there where they say, well, some people were gossiping only to notice the bicycle was leaning against the wall. Well, this is very problematic because that means the postman is going to be able to know, yeah? So, so this is a, so we can, we, can, we can think of this as a fluid relational world where things and substances don't have the stability that we think of them in our existence, in our world. Um, you might think this is a fictional world, but actually this problem with uh, substances flowing, the fluidity and so on, is present in Polynesia. And this is where... I've, I've encountered, and this is when I started to think a little bit differently, and then someone told me about The Third Policeman, which is, and I, it's a really good book to read, it's really, really interesting. So, what I'm going to argue, or what I'm, I want you to ponder, is, are we anomalous, or what are the possibilities in other times and places for this lack of stability and more fluidity to occur between things, people, all objects. It's quite an interesting idea, I think. And uh, I don't want to go into ideas of relational ontology, but basically what that means is things will change um, as when they come into different networks, into different relationships and, and so on, which is, which is basically what I'm arguing. And there's a quote there from which I won't again go in. But basically what it's saying is this notion of fluidity and so on could be quite an import, important thing in other times and places. So, if we're going to say, well, what about the Neolithic? Is this, or could this be a time when this uh, much more fluid notion of materiality and things is present? And if it is, how would we recognise it? What clues do we have that something like this might be going on? And so, I think when, you, when people start to have concern about such things, you'll start to notice things um, will be much, uh, skins, membranes, interfaces become much more important. And necessarily slow, uh, so, because the transgression and flow, as I say there, is of vital concern, because the fact that things cannot constantly be changing and altering according to proximity can be potentially very problematic. So let's have a look at this. I just want to think about skins and surfaces and the substances behind those things. And of course we normally think about skins and so on with living things, don't we? <coughs> and there's some examples of skins and, and, and so on. But of course that's not restricted purely to living things. Other things have skins and surfaces. Here's some rock and stones, for instance. These have what we call cortex or pattern, or all sorts of names we call them. But they too have lots of, they too could be said to have skins and so on. So, I, and I want you to think about that because that's going to come back later on. And also, uh, more broadly in the social sciences, particularly anthropology and archaeology, there's been a lot of discussion about surfaces and how materials aren't static, but actually are constantly changing uh, according to different processes in which they're involved. And this is a quote, this is Tim Ingold's work particularly I'm thinking of here. So, then when we start to look at ma Neolithic material, we start to see something rather interesting. Um, and here, so here's an early pot, and what do we, what's early Neolithic pottery? It's burnished, it's highly polished, it's very smooth. And I would argue you can start to think of that like a skin. And one of the other characteristics of uh, Neolithic 
is polished stone axes. Now, the re again, this, this is quite, for me, quite personally quite interesting, because, oh, a number of years ago when we were working at Stonehenge, we went out on some Marlborough Downs with Josh Pollard, and we came across these polissoirs. Polissoirs are these grooves where they, where they polish stone axes, okay? And I remember touching these and thinking, oh, they're so, it's so smooth. This is such a smooth surface. And I was, then I was thinking, I wondered when, you know, when do Neolithic, you know, what else do they come across which is so smooth? Or what have I come across which is so smooth? And of course, I answer you, skin. Not old skin. <laughs> <laughs> so my argument here is that we're seeing not only pottery having skins, but we're seeing uh, stone axes. And then, of course, you look more, and you find they do it to everything. They polish on the, they polish, they create surfaces on so many different, particularly on stone objects, but also on pottery. But they don't rest just restrict it to that. Monuments too have skins, um, skin, we, skins of masonry. And the bottom right hand, this is a plan of a, a tomb called um, Coy Ness on the island of Sandy. And when Child, Gordon Child excavated it back in the 40s, 30s, 40s, uh, or yeah. And uh, he was excavating it and did these trenches through it. And he found so many walls, <coughs> so many walls, he got confused as to just how many there were. So there was lots of concentric walls running around it. And this isn't just confined to tombs in Orkney or whatever. This is back down in Gloucestershire. This is the, like Ballast Nap. Again, you find constant adding of these skins of masonry to these things. So from that, I would say, actually, this obsession, and it's not just and it's not, not just those examples I've given. If you look at other Neolithic monuments like causewood enclosures and so on, they all have these sort of boundaries, these strong divisions around them. And uh, you know, if you want to push it even further, Neolithic sites which we're excavating today, like uh, the Ness of Brodka and Barnhouse and other, the outside surfaces of the monument actually are beautifully created. They're so smooth, ridiculously so. And I would argue we're seeing that sort of thing manifest in, in, uh, in a broad scatter of architecture as well. Okay, I'm gonna leap sideways a little bit now, and I want to think, go back to the notion of these bodies. Remember I said there's disarticulated and articulated remains in these monuments. Well, there was a really interesting uh, piece of work being done on human skeletal remains at a chambered tomb in Sweden. Uh, and I'll just quickly go through this because I see times. Now, this was, uh, and it was opened uh, back in the eight, early 1800s, and uh, the antiquarian who looked in here found a whole mass of burials. The thing which I found quite interesting about this is look where they're positioned all the way around the walls. And there was this suggestion that the bodies were actually propped up sitting in physical contact with the stone in sitting positions. And uh, just what I was saying to the, uh, my class yesterday, that there's a number of antiquarian accounts in Britain and Ireland where they said the bodies were actually sitting up, resting against the walls of the tomb. But no one's really paid that attention, much attention to that because they're antiquarians and bones tend to be very muddled and confused more often than not. But doing some fancy um, work on the skeletal material, a bit like Ingrid does, I think, with her bones, uh, what the uh, analysis showed was that, um, and this, just go back, this is a sort of, this, there was a sort of, there's a little square where you see these bones, they're fairly chaotically spread. And uh, when they investigated these things, they found that actually they weren't chaotic at all, but that's a product of them being contained or maybe wrapped in crouched positions. And as everything decays this, and the sinews and so on starts to rot, the bones spring apart and it gives rise to what appears to be a very chaotic situation. So, and, and just to sort of just extend that slightly, because there's been so many disarticulated bones found in chamber tombs, people have actually started to talk about processes of what we call excarnation. That's where the body is held out in the open and the flesh 
decay is eaten by birds or rots in the ground or whatever, then the bones are dug up and then they're put into the chamber tomb at a later time. This is to account for that chaotic or fairly haphazard situations of the bones in the tombs. But looking at this, I think this actually counters that quite well and shows that a lot of what we see and take as a sort of dispersed skeletal material actually arises as a consequence of the process of decay. So returning back to, uh, to Britain, this is West Kennet, this is a lovely monument, this is very close to Avebury down in Wiltshire. And again, we can kind of see the same. This, you know, again, we've never questioned, I've never questioned this, I don't think anybody's really questioned it. Here's the chamber down here, it's blocked off. And it actually is that, now look at the immensity of that man. This is a massive thing, far too big. Um, so it, it really is an, another entity, if you like. It's something quite, quite different, I think. And when we look at uh, how that was found, this was excavated back in the 1950s by Stuart Piggott, what do we find? Well, we, we see that sort of chaotic arrangement, which was at the time, if you like, um, seen as a, you know, basically evidence for excarnation, disarticulation. But judging from the work that the Swedish team did, this could well be the results of articulated bodies going in and the subsequent process. And of course, not only that, you will have uh, perhaps later interments going in, shoving the bones to the side and putting in new bodies just to make the thing more messy. And we, as archaeologists, we focused, or Neolithic archaeologists, we focused very much on this rearrangement of the bones as being the meaningful thing um, to such an extent that, uh, like I say, the focus was entirely on the bones and entirely on what that, those actions or those practices represent. And people talked about, oh, this is the dissolution of the body, it's the dissolution of the social body, and, and on and on and on. What I'm going to say now is, have, is this a terrible, or not an error, but is there something more going on in, in these monuments? Oh, and this is, this is just to make, make that point, if you like where the burials are subs sub uh, subsequently disturbed and maybe wrapped and contained and so on and so on. And this is that, that big tomb we saw right at the beginning, this is Tinkinswood, and there we see that uh, again a jumble of bones inside is, was, has been reanalyzed just literally a couple of years ago, uh, or a year ago even, and of the individuals, there's a range of individuals in there, but the, cons uh, the final judgment was that actually these were entire humans, this were, these were inhumations going in, whole bodies going in, which are mixed up and jumbled and so on subsequently. So this is where we come round to, finally, I guess. So whole body's going in, and it's there where the flesh comes off the body. And when I was first doing um, research into Orcadian chamber tombs, the excavators often talk about a black, greasy layer at the bottom of the tomb deposit. I've, I've never seen this, but I, when, when I read that, I thought, oh, is this the flesh mixing with <laughs> the soil? And, because the flesh does decay decay in these monuments. Now here's a danger to all of us. Um, uh, things are altered, can be altered, and sometimes are purposefully altered. Now I, I think we should think about skin as an impermeable membrane that keeps us all in, in place. So any contravention of that is bad. But any contravention of that allows things to have access, okay? I just want to look, this is a good example. This is, and this is what I'm gonna say now, is true for virtually, all well, the examples I'm gonna give, is true for virtually all chamber tombs, strangely enough, apart from, say, some of the Orcadian ones, which use dry stone walling. But most of the other uh, big megalithic tombs, they actually employ large stones, but when you look at them carefully, you find a really interesting thing. And that is, 
and this is in North Wales, this is a tomb in North Wales, and what we find there is all those stones, if you like, all the inside faces are the cleave split surfaces, and the back of those stones are the natural skin, okay? Now you say, oh, well, that's to get a flat surface. But no, none of it. Because a lot of these stones are coming out of the quarries with fairly... So they've deliberately split these stones. And you might think, well, you know, how do you know that? If, and here's another, this is another one. Again, now, not, interestingly, it's not only the uprights which create the sides of the chambers, but also the capstones themselves also have a split side at the bottom. So if you like, if you can imagine the sort of chamber, the, the chamber tomb is composed of, it's out at, the outer side is all the natural skin of the stones, but the inside is all the cleaved inside surface exposed. And it's not just in Britain that we find this. On the con, this is in Denmark, a very famous tomb in Denmark, and uh, that's what the inside likes. And again, all the surfaces on the inside are the split, or the in, inner part of the stone exposed. Now, the people who excavated this, uh, Sven and Torben, they were very interested in this and looked at the stones very carefully, and they found that not only were they the split stones, but they split the stones and then had them, so either together or juxt uh, juxtaposed or opposed across the chamber. So they've actually split stones and then they pulled them apart to create the, ins yeah, so that's really, and, they, and uh, Sven calls these twins. So this is something which isn't just restricted to Britain or Ireland, but also is in Scandinavia and Brittany as well. And Dolman, which, I, which I'm just finishing a project on doing, is exactly the same. And that's something we, this is where some of these ideas sort of crystallised, if you like. If you can see, you can see from the caps, this is quite, this makes the point quite nicely. There's the outside skin, and there is the cleaved surface, and the same goes for the uprights as well, and the same goes for that monument as well. So if we start to think about some of the stuff which has been written on decay, I think one of the, I, I quite like Caitlin de Silvey's work, and, uh, and she makes the point that decay itself isn't, as we often think of it, as a negative, horrible thing, but it can be what she calls generative, and, the, and so the process of decay can give rise to something quite different not only different in terms of substance, materiality, but difference in terms of knowledge and so on. So, sh so I'm just wanting to make the point that decay doesn't necessarily need to be a negative thing, but also can be seen much as a much more productive generative scheme that's going to create new things. And so what I want to argue is that the reason that... Uh, the, the burials are pressed against the side of the tomb. The reason that they are pressed against the exposed inside surface of these stones is to allow the flow of substance between the dead body, the flesh of the dead body, into the fabric of the mound itself. And when you start to think along these lines, the monument, I would argue, takes on a totally different complexion to the way we conceive chambered tombs. And as I go right back to that, we've seen them very much in terms of containers of the dead, somewhere where the dead are put. People talk about these as territorial markers of big tombs. We talk about them as tombs. I want to say that this, they're not that, well, they are that, but they're something a lot different, and there's something qualitatively different at <coughs> that. Oh, there we go. It's playing with power for me. And that leads on to another really interesting thing, just, just in passing for us to consider. And that is, we very much apply our own senses or assumptions to architecture, construction, and monumentality. And that is, we say, oh yes, well you build something to use it, just like you'd build a school 
to, and you know the construction is and then they take down all the shutters in fact there's, this is going on in Orkney at this very minute they're building a big hospital and it's only when it's completed until, it will it then be a hospital at the moment it's just a building site and we use that notion of distinct or that distinction between construction and use when and we insert that into our archaeological interpretation and I think maybe we should if we if we step aside from that and try to strip that assumption away, what difference, or should we think there is a difference between construction and use? Because what I would argue is, if you think of these as tombs, they build a tomb, then they put bodies in, and it becomes a tomb. What I would argue is it's always in a, if you like, an, in a way of becoming. It's always in a state of becoming. And the adding of bones, or bodies, and the absorption of the of the monument with the flesh of those bodies, the monument itself becomes a living thing. And so there isn't a distinction between construction and use. It's all a process of becoming. And so here we are at the, at the very end. So by virtue of the fact that you're putting bodies into it, you're not putting them in as a notion of a tomb. You're putting them in as a resource or a mechanism to create that thing as a living thing. And the more you put in, and you're feeding, you're sustaining that monument. And it's like I say, it's not just a monument that sits in there. It's a living thing, it's a living ancestral entity because it's constituted and composed of living flesh or decaying flesh. So the stuff of the ancestors is now the stuff of that tomb. And the bones, I would argue, the fact we concentrate on, they're almost an irrelevancy. It's the actual absorption of the by the monument of the flesh that of the of the ancestors makes it a living thing. And so, I think, in, you know, this is just sort of going, this is just sort of reiterating what I just said, that uh, rather than thinking of these as we have done, as tombs uh, that where you just put bodies, they're out of the way, they're, they're bit just like a, a, a churchyard or you know, a graveyard or whatever. No, none of it. This is nothing to do with that. This is all to do with the creation of a living thing. And you might, that's, you might think that's a bit far-fetched, but then you start to think perhaps like something like the Maori meeting house. The Maori meeting house is understood as a living ancestor, and when you go into it, all its component parts are seen as part of an ancestral body. So the, the rafters are ribs, and the different parts of it. Is different. So, you know, this isn't something which is under... There, are, there is examples. We don't need to have that, because I think interpretation doesn't depend on that. All I'm saying is we do see something like that we, in a different, a different context. And that is... The end of the seminar. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know actually what happens now. Um, okay. Can I come back in just to thank you, Colin, for that fascinating talk? Uh, I think that's the most original use of Flan O'Brien's work I've seen. Uh, <laughs> It's obviously the first reference in material culture to the third policeman. Um, the philosopher there in that book, he, he was called De Selby. Yeah. And he was known for the uh, the footnotes were actually longer than the text in large parts of the book. And that was his mockery of the academic world. But uh, your fascinating use of material, substance and reference uh, you avoid all those difficulties in, in <laughs> academia. Um, I'll, I'll never be able to read Flann O'Brien in the same way again after this, but anyhow. Um, just to thank you again, and we have some time now for questions, and I suppose it would be only suitable if we start off with your colleagues and friends in the room which you there, before we open it up to the uh, people on the BC. So can I ask, would anybody like to ask Colin a question on, on, on that fascinating talk? Can I just ask if he starts screen sharing? So we can see people? Oh yeah, um, we need to press the computer here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any questions around the room? If the 
bodies were put in in their entirety and bound up, then one would imagine you'd see a lot of smaller bones, whereas in the past certainly people have reported to me that the only thing they find in these tombs are the large bones and the skulls and things, but smaller bones are not there. Um, no, there, is, there are mixtures oh. of bones. Um, and there's, there's no doubt that the, they fiddle around with the bones. Um, and so in tum some tombs you will find uh, piles of skulls, heaps of long bones. But you do, you do find the other bones yeah. as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You also lose a lot of the bones if you dig with a pick and shovel as an antiquarian. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I imagine that sort of cats or something like that might make a difference as well. Cats? Well, well you've got to watch the yes. animals. <laughs> Small animals. Uh, can I ask, um, given your reinterpretation of human remains, would you like to reinterpret any of the other finds and we get the, the animal bones? Um, things like that, whether you, is there a different view you might take of it? Well, um, I suppose if you, if you follow this, one of the interesting things about the animal bones you find in these monuments, and I'll, I'll speak about the Orcadian one because that's really all I know about it as well, is that um, they go in later. They, they reopen these things and go in later, um, which is quite an interesting thing, isn't it? If what, But they do go in quite a lot later, several hundred years. You know, I think that's the problem with archaeologists. We skip over those centuries, you know, and see like three or four hundred years as just a little, but, you know, eight hundred years. Oh, that's not eight. That's a hell of a long time. Mm. Um, um, so you've got two choices there. Either they're doing it for a different reason and taking on a different role, or they're wanting to turn these into animal tombs mm. <laughs> or animal things. But I, I've got a, I've got a modest proposal. Actually, I like your analogy of. Um, of the Maori uh, meeting house and the idea that the tomb is in some way an ancestor, and um, aware of the problem of the complete, the, the serious lack of bodies, that often that there is a burst of activity of putting bodies into the tomb at the beginning, and then long periods of time, a thousand years potentially, passes, and they're still using the tomb, but not as a tomb anymore. Um, what about the suggestion that these are not bodies that are intended to stay in there, but they're actually in some way um, you know, sort of babies, and they would, there would be a period of gestation and then you would expect them to come out. But also in terms of the lifespan of an ancestor, you would expect things to, you know, happen on a seasonal basis. So, you know, it's only young women that have children uh, and therefore would expect to be pregnant. And therefore, you know, if this is an ancestor, then that maybe if it's a really old ancestor, it's, you know, it's past the stage where it has babies inside it anymore. It's just a thought in terms of this analogy of the Chimman ancestor. I, I suppose the I suppose the thing which is quite interesting is the, this sort of fairly recent work, where sites like West Kennet and uh, and it, several of the Seven Cotswold tombs, um, you know, we we thought these were were running over, you know, the, the burials were going in over some considerable time. It was quite, it was quite a shock when Alistair Whittle did his work and only to find that, the, you know, this is a very, very short duration. Um, and that's because we'd had this notion of them going in as communal burial places and, and so on. So you could kind of say, well, actually, you know, this, 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 very, this creation of a living thing is, is a very short period of time. And as I, I was, you know, it's actually part of its making. It's not that you're going to use it for anything else. But of course, then, then Simon, once you get, um, you know, as you pass through time, I suspect it becomes a resource which can be fiddled around with and manipulated, and uh, and put to all sorts of subsequent purposes. Uh, I think the the I just this, I say I just sort of go back to this this main sort of idea that actually it is a totally different entity than we've ever considered before. You know, it's not like it's it's basically a receptacle for burials. It's a fact that there's a need to have the ancestors in it to create a, a living thing, um, and from that point it follows forward. But that may be you know that may be a very short term requirement. That may be a very short term thing, and as we know. 
you know, as you go through the Neolithic, they just sit there in the landscape and people start building other sorts of monuments for entirely different reasons, entirely different purposes. I can't say any more about babies. Could I, <coughs> could I ask you please, um, uh, the human body, depending on temperature and ground conditions or where it's left, will take a different piece of time to decompose. Um, average, I believe, is about seven years, um, seven to ten years. If you have a body propped up against the wall, it's not going to necessarily stay there for ten years, as you said, because they fall and decompose uh, into this random heap. But then a lot of the, the flow is downwards into the floor. The majority of the flow will be downwards, even when the body is propped up against the wall. So much of what is coming from the body that might be moving from the prepared surface from the body will be going actually to possibly an unprepared floor. But of course, you know, if, if, um, if the, the, the radiocarbon work is, is right, um, these are put in and it's like that's it. You know, the thing is shut, away, shut off. So it's all intents and purposes. They've done what they need to do. Thank you. Colin, do you think, um, if I'm thinking about like the cow's heads under the house in the links of Northland, you know, the horn to horn cow's heads formed as a foundation for a house, or the ladies under the house in, in House 7 in Scarabray. They, they're showing similar, the signs of being something similar, aren't they? That they're, that, um, they're deposits that can enable the house to function in, in some special way related to perhaps the, the material that is, the, li the ex living material that's part of the roots of the house, maybe. Yes, I think, I think there's two things there. The first is, we've got such a strict sense of animate and inanimate. You know, I'm arguably animate and this table's inanimate. As soon as you start to blur that, all things are possible. And, uh, you know, and I, you start, I, I remember them finding <coughs> bones and stuff in walls and things. You know, so what, what you, you could, I think you probably are seeing, actually, is the notion of a fabric the fabric of something is as qualitatively different than we think of a fabric. It's potentially got this sort of more dynamic, there's, you know, there's been lots of discussion over the last few years about agent material and agency and so on, and I think this is quite pertinent to, to the sorts of things I'm, I'm saying here, that, uh, you know, just because our world is so dull, you know, um, when you start to look in the ethnographic examples, you find a there's a total blurring between what's animate and inanimate and also when something's animate it often needs to be reproduced you know so which is why I quite like you know the idea of, of, of bodies perhaps over even though a short period of time a sequence of bodies going into a tomb but yes I, I have no doubt that houses uh, it, this is what, what Julie's talking about the Orcadian Neolithic houses and uh, which have these cores and you have stuff in the cores and, and other things. And, and we lose bone up here, but I'm sure there was lots of that sort of stuff. And that the houses themselves, and uh, it's unsurprising really, isn't it? You know, if you think of the house and the association with the household and the occupants, that this should, there should be such a strict separation. And in fact, in Orcadian, histor historically, the hearth itself had sort of as a manifestation of the, the well-being of the, is that right? I think I'm right in saying. So even you go back a little bit of time, you start to see these, these strict divisions breaking down. Um, so I just oh, wondered, Colin, if you could um, say a little more about how you conceive of stone, because I wonder if you're thinking that that is also capable of decay and is quite fluid and permeable, or were you suggesting that that is more hard and, and fixed in its nature? Well, um, the, the fact that they're removing the skin to allow absorption says, it tells you to a degree that they're seeing that as a fairly impermeable membrane. Um, but of course, yes, uh, you know, there's, they do all sorts of interesting things with, with stone. And the fact that they break stone up, 
you know, things like Flint, which does have a, a, a cortex and so on, they break that up to nap the inside of it, could lead you to start thinking about Flint's and, and in a slightly different way. Um, but I, I think one of the, th the points that Ingold makes, isn't it, that actually everything's slightly fluid and changing and, and so on, but that's in a much longer time span. So I would, I would think that they perhaps understood stone as being fairly static. I would say that. Carl, could I ask a question about the, uh, the, the fascinating use of the, the theme you have on covers and skins? and relate that, that to your discussion of the uh, chambers the, and tombs that in a way to extend the theme you could uh, identify tombs as covers for the underworld and the the, body, the bodies in the tombs decaying into that other world and that's the cover of it. Yes. Does that make any sense? Yes it does and, and I think you know um, the truth is, you know, I, I've given a fairly black and white uh, reading of the, of the evidence. And of course, it's far more, I would, I, as we all know, you know, I've, I've kind of had to do that to drive the point home. Um, but things are far more layered and, and so on, because, you know, the fact is the bones, they do play with the but they do move the bones around and so on. And in Ireland, particularly, you find lots of burials in caves. And so, you know, just because the, the, the entity itself is animate, you know, do we just conceive of, of like, a sort of in our contemporary where we think about a soul and the body and, and so on. Again, if you start to look in other ethnographic contexts, you find there's several souls. There's, you know, and, and they go to different places. Some reside where they die, some are where they're placed, some go to a different place. Often they go back to an origin place, you know, from where they once came. So it's it's far more complex. And I do I have always thought that there is that sort of you know there is that subterranean element about these. And when you start seeing the, the caves and things being used in the same way, that also I think gives you a bit of indication that you are dealing with a whole myriad, if you like, of of different <coughs> realms where so what that tells you, unsurprisingly, is the Neolithic is a very complicated, rich, spiritual, for want of a better word, spiritual world. A world that we have no experience of, actually, today. <clears throat> so where, where does this leave us thinking about the, the individuals? Are these insignificant others? Are they simply building materials? Or are, is this a, should we still think of these as being people that were being remembered? I think, I think you could argue about the dissolution of the, of the individuals into an ancestral body that is now the monument, is now the thing. That, you know, um, there was lots of discussion years, a long time ago about that, about the, the, the fact that you're disarticulating burials was a, a form of dissolution of the individual to create an ancestral body. Um, of course, no one really related it to actually a physical thing at that time. But I, I, I think you could see that, so I, I would favour that sort of view, Simon, I guess. So I'm really interested uh, and really excited by what you've Oh, that's shared. great. That's <laughs> music, very, music to my ears. Um, which, and it's unfortunate in a way that we don't have that um, in many cases, unless we're excavating that direct and affective experience of surfaces and spaces. Or, or that's become something that's become contained as well. I'm, I'm really, I want to ask you if you have thoughts about time, because we've been talking about, or I feel you've been presenting something that on the one hand, we might see as a, a linear movement, the idea of uh, you know, uh, the, the, the rites of passage as being a kind of linear movement through states of being, through, um, through creation to rumination to decay, but actually I feel you might be saying something more interesting about the concurrence of time as well as the concurrence of creation and rumination. 
Well, I, I'm sorry, that's not really a question, but I'd like to hear what, what you think about time. Well, there's, yeah. there's a whole series of things going on here, isn't there? There's the sort of the temporality, the stru temporal structure of the, te the of the, 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 the defleshing, of the, let's say the, the defleshing and the absorption. Um, as something Simon said, you know, we, we have to build into this a sort of the cyclical nation, mm -hmm. notion of time that these early agriculturists would have definitely experienced. Um, so it's no, it's no surprise that there's stuff going on outside these monuments, um, perhaps on, a, on, a, on an annual basis. But the other thing is as well that, um, you know, it's, you can imagine these things as, well, in two ways. You could either see them as atemporal in as much as once you've established this, it's a sort of, then it just sort of flows on. Or you could have a situation where regeneration and so on is really important. And that these, if you like, like a battery will die, will die. So you need, to, and I think I used that to feed the, t you know, these, the sequence of burials that we see is almost to nurture and feed the, the monument itself. You're keeping it alive. Um, so, so, uh, so at least three different sort of temporal temporalities and process there, I would say.